We've been looking at the Gospel of John for, for several weeks now, actually, I guess like months now. And so uh, we're, we're, we're getting down toward, toward the end of the, the Gospel. Uh, John said that he wrote this in order that you might believe who Jesus is, and by believing him you may have life through his name. And so this morning's lesson, I guess if I had to come up with a title for it, it would be called The Gardens from John chapter 18, first 11 verses. Now to put it a little bit in context, <clears throat> We saw in chapter 17 last Sunday with sort of the Holy of Holies in the New Testament where Jesus in his most intimate moments with God prayed specifically for himself. Then he prayed for his people, the church, that they may become one. Uh, and then he prayed specifically for you and for me. Uh, that, 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 that he had uh, us on his mind in the final moments of his life before his betrayal. So here we have Jesus sort of doing this. Uh, John tells us that, that the meal is over, uh, that they finished the, the Passover meal. And then as Brother, read the, Brother Joe read the text this morning, when he spoke in these words, he went with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, not all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to him, Who are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Then Jesus said to him, I am he. And Jesus, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back. And fell to the ground. Then he asked them again saying. Whom are you seeking? They said Jesus. Of Nazareth. Then Jesus answered. I have told you. That I am he. Therefore if you seek me. Let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled. But she spoke. Of those whom I gave you have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. That servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall not drink the cup which my Father has given me. Pretty powerful scene. Th this mob comes after Jesus in the garden. Really, there's so much happening. So, so very, very much happening in, this, in, in these 11 verses. But I specifically want, want to, to sort of get you to understand what's happened and what is happening again. What's been done and what's being undone. What what was what 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 has been accomplished and what's being reaccomplished? What was lost? What was found? And, and so to look at that, we're going to really sort of have to spend some time looking at scripture and, and understanding that in the context of scripture. So there are really sort of two gardens, even though they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. We have to look back at another garden some time ago, because this garden is where things went bad. And the Garden of Gethsemane is what's been correcting all those things that happened in that Garden of Eden many, many, many years ago. So Jesus' disciples had left the meal. They, they'd walked to the garden. And this was very intentional. John is letting us know that, that, that this, Jesus did this. Jesus knew Jesus would do this. Jesus led them to the garden uh, very specifically for a specific purpose. Because the, 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 the garden is where Jesus is claiming his lordship. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He's not being defeated here. He's fulfilling his father's mission. He's doing what God had called him to do. He is claiming his lordship. And so when they ask who he was and he says, I'm Jesus. Now they fell to the ground. As you would have fell before the ground before a Lord. At the very pronouncement that that's who I am. And he had it done twice. If that, if, if that's, who you, that's who I am. 
And so Jesus is claiming is mankind also from the penalty of sin. He is going to be captain of our salvation. He's going to be a Lord of all. And so we have to understand that he's in the garden for a specific purpose because it was in a garden that things got broke to start with because sin started in a garden, the Garden of Eden. So, so there's some symbolism we, we really need to appreciate and take, and take advantage of this morning as we look at John 18 and understanding what Jesus is accomplishing here and claiming his lordship. One. It was the beginning of the sin to the end of sin. And that in the first Adam, life began. We recognize that. But Christ, as Paul refers to him as the second Adam, his life would come to an end in the garden. Adam was formed from the dust of the ground and from Adam on, the Hebrew word for dust, God made Adam man. And here Jesus' life would really begin the official end here in the garden with the betrayal. And so it's the beginning and the end in which life began and life would end in the garden. But also it's the fall and rise. In Adam, Adam sinned. You know, when Adam and Eve ate of the knowledge of uh, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they sinned in that garden. And sin entered in. It was paradise. Those of you who are gardening right now, there were no weeds and thorns to take, take, take your effort away. There was no sweating by, the, by, the, by your brow to earn your bread. It was, it was all you can eat, garden paradise. Life was good. No death. No suffering. No sickness. No pain. No doctors. No hospitals. No cemeteries. It's great. It's great. But Adam sinned. And all those things came with it. But in Gethsemane, Jesus overcomes sin. And we're going to look in the next few weeks about what that meant to him. That, that, that he asked God that, that to, to let this cut pass from him. It was not just a physical suffering, folks. It was the taking on of sin, your sin, my sin, the sin of all mankind, because he knew what that meant in, in separation from God. Jesus was willing to do that in order, in, in order to honor God's desire for him, his will for him. There was defeat and victory in the garden. In Edom, Adam fell. In Gethsemane, Jesus conquered. So we, we, we look at Adam's fall and the fall of all mankind because of Adam, because that because our sinful nature, we, we struggle even in our own lives or of our willfulness against God. We know what good is. As Paul says in Romans, he says, I know what the good is. He said, but there's this thing inside me that wars me. And he said, I will to do good, but what I find myself doing is evil. He said, oh, wicked, wicked. Body of sin. Who used to deliver me? And he recognizes our deliverance is through Christ Jesus. In Gethsemane, Jesus became victorious over sin. Because he's fulfilling God's will for him. And then there's the shame versus boldness. In the book of Genesis, it says, When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God. They try to hide themselves from God from the view of the holy God. And needing Jesus is bold. I am He. I am Jesus. There, there, there was boldness there. He presented Himself. And, and, and He says, you know, I, that's me. There's no shame in Him. There, there, there's no reason for shame because He was sinless. He was perfect. He presented Himself as Lord. And Savior. And then we see that in Eden, the war started. That as mankind, we were at enmity with God because of sin. The war began. But, but in, in 
Eden, the war started. But in Gethsemane, the peace began. And and, in Eden, if you remember, when Adam and Sin, Adam and Eve Sin, and they were driven from the garden, they put a sword at the entrance of Eden to keep them from going back. The sword was drawn. But in, in Gethsemane, when, when, when Peter took that sword and, and he went after Malchus's head, and I really believe he was trying to take his head off, he probably bounced off his, his metal helmet and bounced off and took his ear off. Jesus says what? Put the sword away. Put the sword back in the seat. Because my kingdom is not about a kingdom of war. My kingdom is about a kingdom of peace. He said, if it was war, we would go at it. But it's not about that. And so Jesus demonstrates in this garden scene that what was broken in Eden is fixed in Gethsemane. Everything that happened in the garden is being restored in the garden. It wasn't by accident that Jesus led them to the garden. You know, there were things in, in looking at the lesson that, that really led me to believe that, that this symbolism was not just to fulfill some scriptures, fulfill a pattern, but to show us clearly that Jesus was in control. In fact, in John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18, in a few chapters previous, he said, Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up. This command I receive from my father. Jesus says, listen, no one's taken from me. I, I willingly give it. I lay my life down for you. You see, Jesus is fully in control in the garden. He was willing to die for you and for me. There's something else I had never really understood in, in to preparation for the lesson that, that and I've was I've been to the site in Israel that where they said the Garden of Gethsemane is and Olive Grove there and and I've looked across the little valley there uh, and uh, there's no evidence of a of a waterbed there now much but but at the time of Jesus there was a it was called a little brook and then the Bible calls it the brook of Kidron and it's Kidron Ravine Kidron Valley through there you look toward the Golden Gate where the Temple Mount is. That gate's now sealed, but at the time of Jesus, that would have been a gate up to the temple um, mount there. And, and, and I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate sort of the symbolism that Jesus was going through. He led them out the temple gate. There were other gates they could have left, but they left out the temple gate, walked across the the Kidron area where where the Kidron Valley was around the brook there. And, and I never knew what John was sort of trying to bring up, but the people who may have read this early on, the people who were familiar with, with the practices in and around the time may have really appreciated what was happening. But Kent Hughes in his book on, on his on, on commentary on John said of Kidron, he says, a drain ran from the temple altar down to the Kidron ravine to drain away the blood of sacrifices. So the temple mount was there, it's high elevation, and they created a drain if you will, that came out of the temple that could drain down into that valley. And that drain was specifically to deal with all the blood of the sacrifices. And Jesus dies at the time of Passover. And the estimate is about 2,000 lambs have been slaughtered that day. The blood of 2,000 lambs flowing down that ravine into that valley. So when Jesus' and his band crossed that way, because the only way to get to Gethsemane is to walk across that valley up that, up that hill. They're walking on blood-covered ground. This flow of animal sacrifice was flowing across the ground. And they crossed that to go to the garden. It's really heavy with meaning that this blood-soaked earth 
was between us and the garden. That, that Jesus is now fulfilling everything he had to do, but all this is, is foreshadowing what's going to happen again as his blood would eventually atone for all of man on earth. Very, very powerful stuff. Of all that was happening in the garden, can you imagine what our Heavenly Father was experiencing? I know this is Father's Day. And I just, it's a hard Sunday for me. But can you imagine what God's experiencing? He knows. Jesus says, no one's making me do this. I'm doing it myself. I lay my own life down. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what God is witnessing? Can you? I'd heard a story some time ago. And uh, I went to see if, if I could find it. And I found two versions of it in two different books. But um, I'm going to read it to you. I can, and my iPad will work. It's taken from a book, uh, The Promises of God. This is one, one of the versions that I came across. A story circulating on email tells of a preacher who introduced an older minister in the evening service as one of his oldest and dearest childhood friends and asked the older man to share whatever he wanted to say. The older minister told of a man, his son, and his son's friend, who went sailing off the Pacific coast. A fast approaching storm kept them from reaching shore, and as the waves got much higher, the boat capsized. The father grabbed hold of the boat and had just enough rope to save one boy. He knew his son was a Christian and his friend was not. So calling out, he said, I love you, son. And he threw the rope to the friend so he could be saved. The son's body was never found. The guest minister said, How great is the love of God that he should do the same for us. Our Heavenly Father sacrificed his only begotten son so that we could be saved. After the service, two teenage boys who had listened intently came to the older minister and said, that was a great story, but not very realistic. For a father to sacrifice his son's life to save his son's friend? You're right, said the old preacher. It isn't very realistic. But I'm standing here today to tell you that story gives me a glimpse of what it must have been for, for been like for God to give up his son for me. You see, I was a father, and your preacher was my son's friend. You see. 
God knew his son's future. And was willing to sacrifice him in order to throw us the rope. John says in First John, Oh, what love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God. You see, this was a father's choice. Paul says in Romans, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, you put your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. You see, in that garden, the second of two, God made his choice as Christ made his. And I guess that we bring this lesson to an end this morning. I'd say it's your turn. What's your choice? Leave you this morning fully as a child of God. Or walk away from yet one more opportunity to claim what God freely gave for you. To fix what was broken in the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet to allow you to make a choice. Whether to reach for it or turn away from it. We're going to sing this song right now. Brother Steve's going to lead us in. If you're subject this morning, would you come as we stand and sing this song?